The DolphinsTalk.com podcast network is sponsored by Caneswear. Caneswear is the place to go for officially licensed apparel for the Miami Dolphins, Miami Heat, the Hurricanes, Florida Panthers, and all of the professional and college teams in South Florida. Looking for the latest jersey, a birthday gift, or the newest hat to hit the market of your favorite South Florida team? Check out Caneswear for their overwhelming selection of sports apparel. Located at 2655 South University Drive, Davie, Florida, Caneswear has it all. Not in South Florida? No worries. Visit Caneswear.com to shop their inventory from the comfort of your home, and they'll ship it to you. International fans, too. Caneswear.com is the spot that Miami fans shop. That's Caneswear.com. Caneswear.com. You're listening to the DolphinsTalk.com podcast. We most listen to daily. Miami Dolphins podcast on the internet. Come on, Dolphins fans. Time to fins up. We're in the air. We're on the ground. We're always in control. And when you say Miami, you're talking to my ball. Because we're the Miami Dolphins. Miami Dolphins. Miami Dolphins number one. Hello, Dolphin fans, and welcome back to a very special episode of Dolphins Talk. Today, I am joined by NFL Network reporter Cam Wolf. Cam, how are you doing today? I'm good. How are you feeling? I am feeling great, especially since you were literally on my TV screen right here in my office all day yesterday. You were at training camp. How was it? How did it go? Yeah, funny how that works. Uh, it was great. Um, we had to deal with a little weather at some point. It was funny. We were interviewing Tua, and uh, one of the first times it's ever happened to me, the, the lightning siren is blasting while we're in the middle of our Tua interview. He does not flinch at all. He's like, this happens all the time. Um, but like five minutes later, the downpour comes out, and we moved inside. Uh, just kind of South Florida weather. But otherwise, it's been really great. You know, um, I'm, I live down here in South Florida. And so although I cover the entire league as a, a national reporter, the Dolphins are sort of my home team, my home base. And so when we do uh, NFL Network training camp coverage, um, I'm the guy that's usually a fixture here. And then we bring in, you know, some other folks. And so Sunday I was out here with Bucky Brooks and we talked with Tyreek Hill and uh, did some coverage of practice. And then Monday uh, we did the show. We hosted the show from Dolphins and it was myself and Mark Ross and Rhett Lewis and we had a slew of guests from Tua to Mike McDaniel to uh, Raheem Moster to Teron Armstead on. And uh, so it was a blast. It was great. I mean, I had it on literally in my office all day long. And I kept like, I didn't get very much work done. You guys had <laughs> such great interviews. It was so well, we great. We appreciate you. I saw the interview with Tua and the sirens, but everyone's a professional just blowing right through it. Um, so well, speaking of Tua, let's get right down into all of it. So as we all know, and as all Di Dolphin fans are excited about, Tua got his contract extension last week. Does anything in the structure of that contract or the amount of guaranteed money that he received surprise you? Or is that the type of deal you and others expected Tua to get, but it just took longer for the parties to ultimately get there? Yeah, I think that that number makes a lot of sense to me. You know, if you look at the structure of it, there's a little slight differences, but I compare it uh, to the Jared Goff deal. It's very similar to that in the AAV and the total amount of guarantees and even to an extent some of the structure. And so it, it very much feels like a deal where, hey, we're going to make you one of the highest paid quarterbacks. It seemed like two and his team were not, you know, so hell bent on, hey, we have to top the market, which I think was good. I, I think as a team, you never want to set precedence. And so I'm sure that was a little bit of what's holding it up. Are we going to reset it and have them at 55, 56, or we have them at 53? And I think you get at a happy medium with, with where they were. And so the Dolphins, from what I understand, were, were a little lower than 53. They came up 
and you kind of met, met at the middle of what they initially wanted. So I think that there's not a huge ton of surprises here. Uh, like most quarterback deals, it's going to function as a sort of a three to four year deal. And, and at towards the end, the last year or two, you'll probably end up doing an extension if everything goes well, Tua ends up playing well. And so he probably won't see the actual last year. It'll just be kind of the bridge to the next deal. So um, I think it gives him the type of security and generational wealth that he and his family have wanted. Um, and it also really screams that the Dolphins are all in on him as the quarterback. It's not this one-year deal where it's like, hey, we can get out of it or if he gets hurt. No, this is a team that's saying, hey, for the next few years, we're all in on Tua as our quarterback. And uh, we believe in him to lead us to, to the next level. And we need that. I mean, for the Dolphins, you know, 19-something quarterbacks since Dan Marino, six of them with the last name ending in the letter F to start after yeah. Marino. I mean, like, there's been so many quarterbacks. So I know right. on our end, we're super excited to have him, um, you know, really just uh, in with us fully. And so do you think we've seen the best of Tua yet? Do you think he's hit a ceiling? I mean, he hit so many numbers of top passer um, passing yards last year and all of that, but we know he's working with quarterback coach John Beck or he was. So yeah. what do you think we can expect? Is he, has he hit the best we we're going to see, or we got more in the, in the tank there? No, I think he still has room to grow. He's he's in his middle of his 20s. I think that's one thing to remind people. Like he's he's just signed a big money extension, but really, if you look at his career, this is going into maybe his fourth full season. If you look at just kind of the start stops and starts he had early in his career, um, and I think that he has plenty of room to development. And I think when you look at Tua, um, so many of the the media narratives about is what he can't do. You know, he doesn't mm -hmm. throw the ball 70 yards down the field. He doesn't run a 4-4 like Lamar Jackson. I think what he does do uh, makes him a perfect fit in this system. He's uh, an elite anticipation thrower, elite accuracy thrower. His vision is great. And I think with the speed and motion of this offense, there may be quarterbacks who have a bigger name that most people would consider better quarterbacks that would be worse fits in Mike McDaniel's scheme. And so I think that he's at the right home. Obviously, McDaniel's given a lot of confidence. And as we go into like 2025, 2026, I think the element that we're already seeing hints of that maybe he's the next level to a is his mobility. Because mm -hmm. if you remember early in his career, he was a lot more mobile. Um, mm -hmm. He was able to extend plays. He was able to get out of the pocket. Um, and, and a lot of that helps him with uh, being able to get the ball uh, to his playmakers when their first read is not there. This offseason, I reported it throughout camp, he's lost 15 pounds and he plans to play in that 215 to 220 range after playing 230 plus last season. And so I know there was a lot of back and forth of like, well, didn't he gain weight because he was trying to avoid getting hurt? I think the Dolphins and Tua kind of came to the conclusion that a lot of his injuries were coming because he was hitting the back of his head um, on concussions. And so the jujitsu training, the learning how to fall, embrace himself, they feel like they've got a, a lot of success with that last season. And so he can drop to a weight he's more comfortable. Last year, he wasn't as comfortable playing 230, 235. Mm -hmm. but he was doing that because longevity was the key. I think the next level for him is that mobility we're discussing. And not necessarily for him to rush for 500 yards. It's for when your offensive line breaks down. Can you escape outside the pocket and throw on the run? Can you hit Tyreek on a different route if all of a sudden, you know, he gets jammed on the line of the scrimmage like he was in Kansas City in, in that uh, that cold weather game? I think those are elements that help you take that step from really good to a lead and great. And so that's the area I'm probably going to keep a close eye on him this year. Um, can he extend those plays while still displaying the excellence with the quick release, the anticipation and the timing? And that's very valid, you know, as people, you know, big Dolphin fans, people that pay attention to obviously the Dolphins, O-line has been a concern of ours, especially in protection of Tua. I mean, if Tua didn't get the ball out in 2.3 seconds, what does that offense look like? Right. And so the Dolphins, as we know, have had some changes on their offensive line. So we know Robert Hunt and Connor Williams gone, Isaiah Wynn starting training can on the pup list. Are you surprised Miami didn't do more to address this offensive line in this offseason, especially knowing the high um, contract that they were about to give their quarterback? 
I am. I am. Um, I, I'm always honest with folks uh, when they ask me what's my biggest question about the Dolphins. It's the Dolphins aligned to me. I think that if we're looking at this team in December and January and wondering why they didn't achieve their goals, I think it's because the offensive line came apart. I think one thing that's a skill of Tua is that people don't necessarily realize is he minimizes a lot of their issues on the offensive line. Like last year, I give Tua and, and their offensive line coach, Butch Berry, a lot mm -hmm. of credit because they had an endless amount of, of rotations and new people in and injured people in. And um, that offensive line was not in great shape, but yet they were getting through games with zero or one or two sacks. And a lot of that is on how you, you coach up guys, but also if your quarterback leaves the NFL in time to throw like Tua does with that quick release, it helps the offensive line. That being said, it's hard to consistently win um, that way. And so I am concerned about the offensive line, particularly the interior. You know, um, Teron Armstead, when he's on the field, is one of the best three to five left tackles in football, even at his age. On the field is the big key because obviously he's had some injuries in the past. Um, but you have depth with Kendall Lamb. You have long term depth in Patrick Paul. And Austin Jackson kind of revitalized his career last year. Uh, at right tackle. So I'm not as much concerned, honestly, about the tackle spot, but the interior of the offensive line is definitely a huge concern for me. Um, you lose Connor Williams, bring in Aaron Brewer, who's a very athletic center. Um, but I do wonder how he's going to be able to survive in, in the past game. Um, you know, you, you got a guy in Aaron Brewer who's already had a lot of missteps as far as snap connection with Tua in training camp. I was there in practice yesterday and the day before, and I saw at least three or four bot snap exchanges. Now, Connor Williams and Tua had some of those early in camp last year, and they got it figured out. So I'm not panicking yet, but it is something to watch. Um, and so, you know, that spot. And then even at the guard spots, you know, a lot of people uh, talk about the competition that you're going to have between Liam, Liam Eikenberg and, and Jack Driscoll and, and some other guys at that right guard spot. And that's certainly uh, a key spot. But at left guard, you got Isaiah Wynn, who, although he started and played well for six or seven games, he's out with a quad injury. And he hasn't been practicing yet, and there's no timetable. Um, so this is a guy who hadn't played a game in almost a year, and you're kind of penciling him in at, at left guard with no worries. I, it just makes me queasy. Yeah, I'm just going to keep it real with you. It makes me queasy. Um, I'm not the GM here. And clearly Chris Greer has some, 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 uh, I guess, some confidence in this group mm -hmm. that maybe I'm not ready for. Um, but we're going to see how it goes through camp. I'd anticipate, you know, they keep an eye on the waiver wires when we get towards cut time. There's always, you know, we trade our depth for your depth. Um, but everyone's looking for offensive line help. So, I get it. It's probably not a lot of options out there that mm -hmm. they feel great about. But if you if you ask me my number one concern about this team right now, it's, it's the offensive line. Yeah, I think we can all share that sentiment. And you were talking about those guard spots. I mean, do you think we're possibly looking at maybe Lester Cotton and Robert Jones, week one starters at the two offensive guard spots? Or do you see somebody different in those positions? Yeah, right now I would say they're definitely in the competition. I would I'd, I'd be intrigued to see what type of – players they want in each spot because when you look at just kind of what they've done in guard in the previous years robert hunt has been the fixture for many many years and then you've had that left guard spot that's kind of been rotating right guard is now different do you need a bigger uh offensive lineman like a lester cotton or rob jones or do you still value athleticism at that spot because rob hunt gave you the value of being big and athletic mm -hmm. um i would say that lester cotton and rob jones although they have some athleticism that's not their strength i think the the, the strength for them is maybe their power whereas you got a jack driscoll and you've got a liam eikenberg who are probably more athletic than strong and so a part of that is going to be performance and also style like your right guard is traditionally your more powerful, your more run blocking uh, position, but it all changes a little bit in an outside zone scheme where you got to get to the second level and get to the linebacker. Um, they, those fellows got to show consistently they can do that, Lester Cotton and Rob Jones. So I I completely view this as a open competition where any of the four guys I've mentioned could could win uh, that right guard spot. And, and if Isaiah wins not ready for week one, the left guard spot as well. Well, I guess the next few weeks will be very telling for us, so we shall see what happens. So kind of moving on, let's talk about a little bit about some of the injured players and that are rehabbing. Currently, we have Jalen Phillips. We've 
his rehab has been a whole topic of conversation this off season. Yeah. <laughs> we see a lot of pictures and videos of him out there running, rehabbing. Do you think there's a realistic chance he will be ready by week one? Or as fans, are we being way too optimistic when we are looking at closer to maybe October? Maybe. Yeah, I wouldn't count Jalen Phillips out for anything. You look at okay. that guy, he's a physical freak, man. Like, yeah. uh, he, he, he just, you know, if you were creating a Madden uh, player uh, as your edge rusher, he'd probably look like Jalen Phillips. And I've seen him uh, work out. I've seen the videos, but I've also seen him at practice. And every time he's out there, he wants to show us him running. Um, and, and he is running. I will say this. He does not look 100% yet, mm -hmm. um, which is perfectly understandable. He's eight months removed from an Achilles surgery. Uh, traditionally, that's been a nine to 12 month uh, recovery period. Um, recently, you've seen more quicker recoveries where they're closer to nine. It used to be a full year. And so he got hurt on Black Friday, which is November. So nine months would put him right around the start of the season. Um, so I wouldn't rule it out. But here's what I would say. I would have very cautious expectations uh, for him and Bradley Chubb the first half of the season. So even if Phillips does come back, I don't think he's going to be the Jalen Phillips that you anticipate. Like, I don't mm -hmm. think I think it's going to take some time. That's one of those injuries where as much as it is physical, it's a, it's a mental thing, too. Can I fully plant on that that ankle, that Achilles with the same strength and the same comfort that I did previously? A lot of that takes time. And so if I were the Dolphins and I think they are, you got to play the cautious route because the reality is you need those guys sacking quarterbacks in December and January more than you do in September and October. And so um, Bradley Chubb is seven months removed from that ACL. He injured that New Year's Eve. I think that he's probably less likely to be ready week one than, than Jalen Phillips. I haven't seen him run yet in front of us, whereas I have seen it from Phillips, but I've seen them both doing rehab assignments. I just would imagine that first month, that first month and a half of the season, you're going to see most of your edge rusher reps coming from your Emmanuel Agba, coming from your Chop Robinson, your Muhammad Kamara um, going forward. And, and maybe they add another guy um, before before the start of the season. Yeah, I mean, dang Aaron Rodgers. He set us all up to, like, you know, expect a player to come back in a, <laughs> in a much shorter amount of time. So our expectations are way up high. But we, we've tempered them No setbacks, though. No setbacks, yeah. though, which is good. Which is great. So speaking of Emmanuel Ogba, the Dolphins brought him in last week. Do you think they bring in another veteran edge rusher in the coming weeks, depending on how Chop Robinson and Mohamed Kamara look the first few weeks of training camp, especially now that they're practicing with pads on? Yeah, a lot of times teams want to go through this first period of training camp, at least up and into this first preseason game, to let these young guys show them what they they got. And so mm -hmm. Chop Robinson and, and Muhammad Kamara have definitely had a really good start to training camp. I still think that depth is a little thin at that edge spot. And so, at least in my mind, even if they are participating well, you're going to need another edge guy. Mm -hmm. um, to me, like I said, I would anticipate – it being a luxury if I got Jalen Phillips and Bradley Chubb to be playing in those that September, early October period rather than a permanent. And so if I'm anticipating that, then I need at least four edge rushers for that first month of the season. Right now, I feel really good about three that are going to be able to contribute from week one. The three guys I mentioned still guys competing in there. Quinn Bell's had a, a pretty good camp. As well, he's a guy that's that can push to make a, a roster spot. And um, a lot of times for vet edge rushers, you see a lot of these guys getting cut um, closer to the start of the season, whether it's salary regions or just kind of a, a bundle of, uh, of players at that position group. So I'd imagine they're active in the waiver wire as well. They worked out both Agba and Yannick and Gakwe, but um, they just decided to sign Agba. Maybe they circle back in Yannick, but I, I can't imagine uh, the price for Yannick is something they want to pay along with Agba. So I'd imagine they're going to try to find someone closer to the minimum um, as we get closer to the season. I feel like people, like reporters must have the hardest time with the Dolphins saying the names, like learning the last <laughs> names of this team and pronouncing them properly. We have yeah. some of the coolest last names in the NFL. I love it. Um, so keeping in line with the defense, Anthony Weaver, as we all know, is the new defensive coordinator this season. Mm -hmm. What style of defense do you think Anthony is going to run this season in Miami? And how can you do you see it being different from what Vic Fangio did last season? Yeah, they're going to be really aggressive. You know, if you watch the Baltimore Ravens, it's going to be very similar to what they did there. You know, Anthony Weaver spent the last few years there. It's not his only blood. He spent some time in Houston and Cleveland and elsewhere. But I think you're going to see a very similar 
style. And what I mean by that, for people who haven't watched a lot of Ravens football, they do a lot of simulated pressures. And that very much looks like guys coming off the edge, um, whether they're coming or not, showing that they're coming. And so I had a, uh, a offensive coordinator compare it to me as when you play the Ravens, you're almost playing 13 players at mm-hmm. once because you're you're seeing a guy on the edge coming and you're anticipating him coming and then he drops back in coverage. And then a different guy comes that you didn't think he's going to come. And so you want people to be seeing ghosts, so to speak, like not knowing where people coming from. So it's, it's, it's showing them a lot of different looks, showing them a lot of different illusions. But for the defense, it being very simple, and what they do. It's kind of a opposite of what Mike McDaniel does on the other side of, of mm-hmm. the motion, right? A lot of the motions have a plan. And even if the motion isn't necessarily a factor in the play, it's something that creates the defense to look at something else. It creates them to react. And then the team can react off that. I think the the defense, the Dolphins are playing the play is going to be very similar. Uh, they're going to play zone coverage, a decent amount on the back end, but they will play some man when they need to. Um, and I think more than anything, you'll see versatility from the players. You mentioned Vic Vangio's defense. A lot of times that defense was very much you stay in your spot. This is what we're going to stick and play. We're not going to blitz a lot. We're just going to do our coverage and be best at it. I think the Ravens, you're going to see a lot of players playing different spots. I wouldn't be surprised if you see Javon Holland coming down and playing the nickel sometimes. Maybe it's Jalen Ramsey coming inside playing the nickel or the star spot. Him following receivers, Jalen Ramsey, um, where he didn't do that much last year. And that's something he very much wants to do. So I think you're going to see a lot more uh, different looks, and it may change week to week. Whereas I think Vic Fangio was a little bit more standard uh, of what his defense does. Well, we are excited to see it. Um, The countdown has officially started. Um, So going into a little bit, pivoting a little bit into contracts. So we know Tua got his, super excited. Jalen Waddell, he was extended a few months back. Miami has Javon Holland and Jalen Phillips from that same draft class. And they can extend basically at any time at this point. Do you think we will see Waddle or Phillips extended prior to the start of the season or maybe in season? Or do you think they're going to wait until next offseason? Uh, Holland or Phillips? Waddle, Waddle definitely got his money and he is uh, happy about that. But Javon Holland um, is next up um, because yeah. he's in the final year. He's in the final year of his deal. Um, and unlike uh, Waddle and Tua and Jalen Phillips, he doesn't have a fifth year option. So when he is done this year, they're going to have the option of putting a franchise tag on him, giving him an extension or letting him test free agency. And as we saw with Christian Wilkins, that's, you know, you don't want to get it to free agency where those dollar amounts become crazy. Uh, I guess starting with Javon, here's what I would say. Uh, Javon, I think, has the potential to be one of, if not the best safety in football. Last year was a little tough for him injury wise. And so he hasn't yet got the Pro Bowl, the all pro accolades that typically come for guys that become the highest paid safety in football. Um, But he does have an agent in David Mulligetta and Athletes First, uh, who has a history um, of giving safeties uh, market setting contracts. And so I think Javon Holland uh, would love to be on the phone with Chris Greer right now as far as talking extension. He's told us that time and time again, my phone is open, Uh, but I also think it's going to cost a lot. And so I am curious if they want to see him play out this year, ideally stay healthy for the full year, put up that Pro Bowl, all pro year he's capable for. And then you pay him that market setting safety number because they're going to ask for it, in my opinion, regardless. They're going to ask for that Antonio Winfield 20 plus million dollar deal regardless. And so um, that one definitely is on the radar. I just don't know if that one is imminent right now. And Jalen Phillips, probably similar to even the more extreme extent also has a fifth year option so he's going to have his fifth year option he could play on and he's also got to prove that he can stay healthy um coming off that achilles i think you're going to see him play this season and then close to the off season or maybe december or january you start thinking about extension for him um and then tyree kills probably the other one that i would keep an eye on because he only has one more guaranteed year on that deal he has i think three in total but just one guaranteed and he has been vocal Um, that he would like a deal. I talked to him uh, on our air on Sunday and I asked him about it and he said, yes, I definitely talked to Drew and we definitely want that extension. But my big thing is Drew, don't get me traded again. It's like Mm. last time we had a contract dispute, uh, it was in Kansas City and I got traded and he's like, I want to be in Miami. And so um, he's one of those guys that also 
you know, you, you go through the year. I don't think we're looking at anything that has to be done before the start of the season with any of the three guys I mentioned. Like Tua is one of those deals that, hey, we're going to go through the season. Maybe we have some negotiations, um, but ideally we get something done um, by the time we hit the offseason next year. And this is why you do what you do, because that was going to be my next question, Tyree Hill. <laughs> Thank you so much for answering that for me. Absolutely. Um, so, okay, so now we are looking just as a whole big picture. This is year three of Tua running this Mike McDaniel offense, and the Dolphins have added some pieces to the tight end room with Jonu Smith and Jody Fortinson. How much do you think we will see the tight ends incorporated into this off, uh, offense this season? I feel like we haven't seen it as much, and especially it being a team that's kind of yep. like Kyle Shanahan. I mean, his yep. tight ends, I mean, obviously when you have someone like George Kittle, that's going to happen, but how do you see that being incorporated this season? I definitely think it will have a lot bigger role. You know, I think they've tried to find the right tight end the last couple of years, mm -hmm. and they haven't. And I think Jonu Smith is, is going to be uh, a great addition um, because in this offense, you have to be able to block and catch. It's very hard to have a one-dimensional tight end. I remember when they made the transition from um, – from Brian Flores to Mike McDaniel, there was a lot of that talk about Mike Gesicki. And Mike Gesicki um, can be a really good straight line player when using the right offense, uh, but he was a liability as a blocker. And I think that it, ma it makes you too one dimensional in that aspect when you have that type of player. Um, and the last year or two, we've had Durham Smythe, who's primarily a blocker, who's caught some passes, but primarily a blocker. I think John O. Smith's their most complete starting tie in they've had in the Mike McDaniel era. And because of that, I think you'll see more plays called for the tight end. I think the luxury the tight end has in this offense is that Jalen Waddle and Tyreek Hill on every single play are going to have extra attention, mm -hmm. extra eyes, whether it's double coverage on one, both, or you have a deep safety for one or both. And so that means there's going to be a lot of individual one-on-one -on -one assignments against linebackers, against, you know, um, safeties for your inside players. That's your slot receiver. Um, that's your third receiver if he's on the outside, and that's your tight end. And so that's why I think there, should, there was a lot of focus on a John O. Smith and an Odell Beckham Jr. Because you need somebody when um, you have to beat your one-on-one -on -one assignment against a inferior defender, can you do it? John O. Smith has consistently shown he can do that. Odell Beckham, same when he is healthy. And so I think John O. Smith's going to have a lot of opportunities where you're going to be like, John O. Smith's wide open in the middle of the field because he beat the <laughs> linebacker. And, and I think that's the way they want it. And so I think John O. Smith's definitely going to have um, a productive year here. And I think it'll open up more lanes for this offense and even the run game even more because you can't sit in that box um, in any capacity when you have three receivers that are dangerous on the field. 100%. Well, we know your time is valuable. So I've got two more quick questions for you and we'll let you get out of here and enjoy your day. Absolutely. So um, one question I have is who do you think is a Dolphins player who is flying under the radar and nobody is really talking about too much who may have a breakout season or may surprise us in 2024? Hmm. Let me think about that. I'll give you one on each side of the ball and I'm actually going to do that. a little, little different here. Um, I'm going to do a young guy and an old guy. Um, okay. For the young guy, I'm going to highlight Malik Washington, their six-round pick. He's had a really good camp so far. And right now, at, we have not seen Odell Beckham on the field. And so, ideally, at some point, he's back out there and ready for the season. But the reality is Odell has had some injuries in the past. And so, I think there has to be who is that next guy that can fill that third receiver role that I've talked about. We've had a slew of them who were on the roster who were there last year, and Braxton Berrios or Eric Azucama. Um, and, and those guys, River Craycraft, and those guys are still there, but Malik Washington has a little bit more juice than maybe those guys. And so whether it's at a returner spot where I think he's going to get some reps or whether it's, hey, he's your fourth receiver and maybe he can play more reps when a guy gets hurt, I think that Malik Washington is a guy who I think people are going to know his name pretty early in the season. Um, on the defensive side of the ball, I'm going to go with Jordan Poyer because I think um, a lot of people in Buffalo maybe have put out the narrative that he's washed because he's 33 <laughs> years old and he had to take essentially a minimum deal to play in Miami. But I'll tell you what, I've been watching him pretty closely my days in training camp. He looks like he has a fountain of youth. He's moving very well. He's making plays on the ball. He had an interception today at practice. He's had some pass breakups. And his chemistry with Javon Holland has already started to, to really uh, 
look very smooth. I watched them in pre-practice. They do drills together uh, with their position coaches where they're going through coverages and communicating and all the things you need to do to kind of gel as a duo safety in this league. And I've covered Jordan Poirier for years and years. And although maybe he's declining a little bit in this range, he's always going to bring the physicality and he's always going to bring the communication and the leadership. And I think that's something this Dolphins defense needs. Um, you lose Christian Wilkins, you lose a Landon Roberts the year before, you lose losing a lot of vocal leaders on this team. And I think Jordan Poirier is definitely going to bring a lot of that within. And I think he could also help Javon Holland with some of the knowledge he just has um, throughout playing this game for a decade plus. So I think you're going to see a lot of uh, uh, Javon, I mean, uh, Jordan Poirier, um, good plays showing up for, for this team. Well, we would not mind if Jordan Poyer showed up and showed out, especially being an ex-Bills fan. We would just, I mean, ex-Bills, we would love that. So, yes, yes. Um, Last question for you, Cameron. So the AFC East is very wide open. Do you think the Dolphins or the Jets, we're going to disregard the Patriots, which is crazy, but Dolphins or the Jets can dethrone the Bills as the AFC East champs this season. And which one of these teams stands out to you heading into this season? Yeah, for me, the Bills are still the champs until you beat them. I know they lost Stephon Diggs, and so there's going to be a lot of attention on how they replace him. they got a rookie in Keon Coleman who's had a nice camp, but he's still a rookie. Um, so I'm eager to see how that plays out. But everybody got to knock him down. I would probably have the Dolphins as as the closest right now just because I've seen them do it. I've seen them be right on the knocking door last year and just falling short. I think the Jets – there's a lot of intrigue because Aaron Rodgers is back, but there's also a lot of unknown of what is he going to look like as a 40 year old quarterback coming off a torn Achilles. We all assume that he's going to be the same player, but we don't know that yet. And so that to me is a question. The Jets offensive line has been a disaster. Um, they made some improvement, but it's still very much a question mark there. And so I think I just have more questions about the Jets at this stage than I do the Dolphins. But I think it is going to be an incredibly close three-horse race. I think the Bills, the Dolphins, Jets, I wouldn't be surprised if any of those three teams uh, win the division. And I wouldn't be surprised if all three of those teams made the playoffs, kind of similar to what the AFC North did last year. So it's going to be a fun race. But as, as of now, I would say I think the Dolphins are maybe the biggest challengers to the uh, Bills. Well, our listeners are going to love that answer. So I think if they didn't know you already, they're now major fans of yours. So yes. thank you. Um, well, I just want to say thank you so much. And everyone that's listening, Cam Wolf can be found on NFL Network all season long, as he said, covering all the teams. But since he's down in South Florida, definitely come covering the Miami Dolphins. Be sure to follow him on Twitter, Instagram, at Cameron Wolf. C-A-M-E-R-O-N, and Wolf is spelled W-O-L-F-E, at Cameron yes. Wolf. Cameron, any parting words for the Dolphin fans listening out there? No, I appreciate you guys all for following me. Uh, I've covered this team in some capacity uh, for the last six years, whether it be at ESPN or NFL Network. And um, I think you guys are a very, very strong fan base. You're very informed. Um, and I love just kind of how engaged you guys are on social media and just kind of creating your own community. And so um, when you reached out and asked to do this pod, I felt like you connect directly to the fans. Um, and it's my way to be able to try to give you guys a little bit more direct Dolphins insight um, through me. So definitely uh, eager to see what they do this year. Well, we really appreciate it. I know the fans do for sure. Everyone out there in Dolphins Nation, have a great night. Be safe. And we will see you next time. Fins up. Yeah.